Hi and welcome to this tutorial, which is part of the Sickle Summer Sessions and which I'm calling Sickle Programmer's Toolbox. My name is Philipp Salzmann. I'm a PhD student at the Distributed and Parallel Systems Group at the University of Innsbruck, where I focus on distributed runtime systems for GPU clusters. In particular, I'm working on an open source project called Celerity that allows you to write Sickle programs that run on GPU clusters. In this video, I'd like to tell you some of the things that I've learned in the past couple of years of working with Sickle. It's basically going to be a random collection of useful tips and tricks that might help you be more effective at your Sickle application development. In particular, I'd like to highlight some of the, I think, lesser known features of Sickle that uh, still can come in handy in a lot of situations. That being said, this is not going to be an intro to Sickle, so I do expect you to have at least some idea of the basics. If you're a beginner, that's fine. However, you should at least know what a Sickle buffer is, how command groups are used to submit kernels, and how you can use accessors to operate on buffers. Note that most of the things that we're going to talk about today will be based on the current Sickle 1.2.1 revision 7 specification. As you may know, however, a provisional Sickle 2020 specification has been released recently. So if there's any major changes affecting anything we're going to talk about today, I'll be sure to mention it as well. Do keep in mind, however, that the specification is provisional and therefore subject to change. I'd also be remiss not to tell you that with all of the code examples that I'm going to show you today, depending on the SQL implementation that you end up using, your mileage may and will vary. While there are many implementations available today and they are rapidly improving, none is perfect yet. I do, however, sincerely believe that this is a great time to get into SQL development. And with that out of the way, let's get going. To start things off, I'd like to talk about something that you may have already heard about. A lot of people are excited about this Sickle feature, me included. The feature I'm talking about is the Sickle host device and it's used for debugging. If you don't know what the Sickle host device is, let me give you a brief overview. So as you may know, Sickle is an API and runtime system targeted at programming various heterogeneous architectures, including GPUs, FPGAs and other accelerators. But since it is a so-called embedded domain-specific language, unlike for example CUDA, it doesn't add any new syntax to the underlying language, which in this case is C++. This means that any valid Sickle program is also a valid C++ program and that it can be run on any plain old CPU. And that is what the Sickle host device makes use of. So what I have here is a simple program that computes a Gaussian blur as a convolution over an input image. The kernel is rather simple in that I iterate over the Gaussian filter and sum up the surrounding elements of the current work item using the filter. When doing a convolution, we always have to consider how to handle the values near the border of an image. In this case, I would like to have the values at the borders wrap around, and I'm using this custom sample function to implement this behavior. Let's take a look at this function now. This function simply samples from the provided accessor using the work item ID shifted in the x and y direction. To achieve the desired wraparound behavior, we also have to check whether the shifted ID goes below zero or exceeds the size of our image. Unfortunately, the implementation seems to have a bug, because if we execute it, we get a segmentation fault. Let's now use the host device to take a look at this problem. To do so, we create a new Sickle queue and instead of using the default selector, we're now using the Sickle host selector to select the host device. Having created our queue with the host device, there's nothing else to do for us other than to simply recompile the program and see if we can get it to crash on the host as well. Now, one problem that we can have with the host device is that it's typically implemented as a simple sequential execution of kernels. This means that for larger kernels, it can actually take quite a long time to execute and therefore take a long time to reach wherever our problem is. Let's abort this for now. The kernel is rather simple and I suspect that the error is likely to be somewhere around the edge wraparound code. To speed things up, we can try and execute our kernel with an offset. When executing a kernel with an offset, all of the work item IDs given to our kernel function will be shifted by the offset. If we now also reduce the range of our kernel, we can execute our convolution only on certain parts of the image. I will now try and run the kernel alongside all of the four edges and see where I can get it to crash. I'm also reverting back to the compute device, as I know it to crash reliably. After running the convolution on all four sides, we can see that it crashes for the lower border, which is great, because now we know that we can narrow down our search to these few pixels at the very bottom of the image. Let's revert back to the host device and recompile. If we take a look at our sample function again, what I'm interested in is whether this wrapped ID here ever reaches a value that is outside of the range of our image. Since we are running on the host device now, we can simply attach GDB to it and debug it like any other C++ application. We can create a conditional breakpoint on the condition that the wrapped ID is outside of our acceptable range. 
Note that we need to access the private members of the ID here as GDB otherwise seems to have some problems evaluating this condition. The image we're using is 960 by 800 pixels large. So let's check whether this goes outside of 960 in the zero dimension or outside of 800 in the one dimension. Note that because sickle IDs are unsigned 64-bit integers, we don't have to check values going below zero as they will simply wrap around. Let's continue with our new breakpoint. After running for a while, we appear to have hit gold. Let's take a look at our values. As we can see, we're actually trying to access the buffer at location 960 in the zero dimension, even though the highest legal index is 959. So this constitutes a classic off by one error. Let's now go back into our implementation and fix the code. I'm feeling confident about this fix, so I'm going to revert the offset and I'm also going to run with the OpenCL device again. Let's now run it again. No crash and the result seems to be correct. Another situation where we have to get kind of creative with our sickle host device when debugging is whenever we have some long running simulation that submits a series of kernels and we want to debug a certain time step of that simulation. We want to avoid having to run every single time step up until that point through the host device, the reason being again that the host device is most likely a sequential implementation that won't perform very well, especially if we're using a debug build. There's a neat trick you can use in these situations. If you take a look at this program here, we have a simple loop over a series of time steps and within each time step we submit our kernel that reads and writes from the same buffer. Each consecutive time step updates the value within that buffer and since this is only an example, we are not really doing anything useful here. Instead we are simply calling this function some expensive computation. This function ends up increasing the value stored within our buffer by one for each time step. As I said, we want to debug this and let's say we know that our error occurs somewhere during time step 66. What we can do now is to create a second queue. We're going to call this the host queue and again pass the host selector to select the host device. Then we're simply going to copy this entire block and check whether we are at time step 66. If so, we want to use the host device to submit this kernel. Everything stays exactly the same, we just have to make sure to give it a unique kernel name. Now we can again use GDB to step into the execution at time step 66. I'm going to set a breakpoint within the host device kernel and then run the program. So here we are. Let's go into this function and let's inspect the current value of v. It's 66, as we expected, and from here we could then go ahead and try to debug this function. I think this is pretty neat, if you consider that up until that point all time steps were executed on the compute device, and we still got the correct value in our buffer once we ran on the host. So why does this work? The reason for this is that unlike in lower level programming models, a sickle buffer is really an abstraction over a set of devices instead of being bound to any particular device. By submitting this kernel to our host queue instead of our device queue and accessing the same buffer, the sickle runtime implicitly ensures that the most up-to-date version of the buffer is being copied to the host device before the kernel is being executed. The host device is however not the only effective way we can debug sickle programs today. In my opinion, one should never forget about the sickle stream interface, which allows you to do printf debugging from within a kernel, even on a compute device. Simply create a sickle stream object within your command group, and you'll have the familiar, albeit somewhat clunky C++ IO stream style interface available for debugging. I find this method of debugging especially useful in situations where you have more complicated index calculations within your kernel, and you want to see multiple values for various threads at the same time. Other ways to debug include using the excellent vendor tools that may be at your disposal depending on the SQL implementation that you're using. For example, NVIDIA's CUDA GDB or Intel's GDB Server GT, which is available as part of their One API initiative. Finally, don't forget that you can use other tools as well. For example, when using the host device, you could run your program through Valgrind to detect out-of-bound buffer accesses, or if running on a CUDA-based implementation, be sure to give CUDA memcheck a try. This brings me nicely to my next point. Know your SQL implementation. While the current SQL 1.2.1 specification is designed to be implemented on top of OpenCL, we have already seen that other backends can be used to implement a substantial subset of the specification. For example, HipSQL, which is built on top of AMD's HIP, which in turn is an abstraction layer over CUDA and the Rockham platform, allows us to run SQL programs on these vendors' preferred software stacks, unlocking all the tooling and performance benefits that come along with them. Thankfully, SQL 2020 is looking to move away from the tight connection to OpenCL, opting for a much more generalized backend model.
However, even today, knowing what your SQL implementation of choice is built upon can be very useful and not just for tooling support. Consider this program, where I've implemented a simple SGEM or Single Precision General Matrix Matrix Multiplication using an ND range kernel. Unfortunately, when I run this on my RTX 2070 using Hipsicle's CUDA backend, I find that I only achieve a measly 10% of the theoretical 7 teraflops or so that should be attainable on this device. Now, we could go ahead and use NVIDIA's Nside compute to try and figure out what the problem is. Likely, we'd find that the number of arithmetic operations within our kernel is too low for the number of shared memory accesses that we're making. We could then go ahead and implement some sort of multi-level tiling scheme to try and increase the arithmetic intensity. However, usually a much better idea in these cases is to resort back to an existing SGEM implementation that has been tuned for the existing hardware. SGEM is a standard kernel that exists in basically every half-decent BLAST package, so there should be plenty of options. While there even exists a SQL-specific solution, SQLBLAST, which you can find over on Coldplay's GitHub account, in this case I'm choosing to go with Cutlass, a template library by NVIDIA. I'm doing so for two reasons. First, Cutlass has been optimized for the hardware I have at hand. And secondly, because it helps me to make this point. So let's go ahead and clone Cutlass from GitHub and include it in our SQL program. Now let me just paste some Cutlass boilerplate and call it from within my main function. Much better. We can see that Cutlass gets very close to achieving the theoretical maximum performance on this device. Cutlass is a template library, meaning that whatever these template functions and classes expand to will contain actual CUDA code. We are executing CUDA code from within our SQL program. Since HipCycle is ultimately compiled as CUDA code, this just works. Now if we wrap the calls to Cutlass within a preprocessor conditional, we can actually keep this implementation portable and only use the optimized kernel if we're compiling on a compatible SQL implementation and backend, falling back to my own implementation otherwise. One downside of this current approach is that we cannot really reuse any existing SQL buffers as input or output for our Cutlass SGEM, as Cutlass expects raw CUDA pointers and there's no way we can obtain these on the host from our SQL buffers. This means that if the SGEM is part of a larger computation, we'll have to first copy our data from the SQL device to the host, use it to initialize the CUDA buffers, execute Cutlass and then do the reverse process to get it back to SQL. Less than ideal. Now, if we really wanted to, we could go ahead and poke into HipSicle's internals to try and get the underlying CUDA buffer pointer that is backing the HipSicle buffer and use that as the input and output for Cutlass. While that would work, this is hardly a nice solution, nor is it portable. Thankfully, SICL 2020 takes care of this problem by introducing so-called host tasks that together with an interop handle can be used to obtain the native backend objects from buffers and other SICL runtime objects. Remember back in the section on host device debugging, we talked about how using a second queue for the host device would automatically cause SQL to migrate our buffers to the correct location before it runs our host kernel. This implicit data movement is one of the many convenient features of SQL boosting developer productivity. However, in some situations, we may want some more explicit control. For this reason, the SQL API provides us with the aptly named explicit memory operations. To use them, we first submit a new command group on our queue, just like for kernel launches. Instead of calling parallel4, however, we can use the command group handler's copy function to initiate an explicit copy from a device buffer to the host and vice versa, as well as between buffers. Two other explicit memory operations are available. The first, fill, can be used to initialize a buffer with a given value. The other, update host, is used to force the SQL runtime to update the host memory region backing the given device buffer. Before using this, however, make sure to consult the spec on when you are allowed to access this memory and how. Previously, we used kernel offsets to limit the kernel execution space for quicker debugging. The kernel offset functionality can, however, also be useful for actual applications. For example, if you want to steer the execution of a kernel based on user feedback or to adaptively refine certain parts of your computation using an iterative method. Remember that you can specify a global offset for a kernel simply by passing a second argument to the parallel4 function. However, do make sure to also adjust your execution range. In this case, this kernel will now be executed only for the work item indices starting at 5.12 and going through 10.23. While this is nice, there is an additional optimization opportunity here that we should make use of. Since we are only executing part of a kernel here, we are also likely only going to access parts of our buffers. By providing the SQL runtime with information on which parts of a buffer we want to access, we unlock the possibility for the runtime to further optimize execution. Similar to how we specify a kernel offset, we can also specify a range and offset for an accessor. This tells the SQL runtime that we only intend to access this part of the buffer from within the kernel. The advantages of this are twofold. First, if we're using any kind of reading access mode, for example read-write, 
and the current buffer version doesn't reside on the device we're accessing it on, the cycle runtime could optimize this access and only transfer the bits that we actually need. A second benefit may kick in once we have another kernel that operates on this buffer. Let's say that the second kernel here starts at offset 0 and computes the items through 511. If we now also adjust our accessor to only access this range, the cycle runtime could in theory decide that these two kernels can and should run concurrently on our compute device, thus optimizing execution times. Next, I'd like to talk about something really fun. Placeholder accessors. You might have heard of placeholder accessors before, or maybe you've just noticed that there's this mysterious additional template parameter for accessors that defaults to being false. You can look into the spec and read up on what a placeholder accessor is, but in my opinion, that doesn't really tell you what they're useful for. I'd like to use this opportunity to take you through an example that hopefully demonstrates how placeholder accessors can be a really useful tool for generic programming with SQL. Consider this program. I have this generic init function here that I want to use to initialize my buffer with an arbitrary value. And I'd also like to be able to initialize other buffers with different values by using the same function. While that is a very basic use case, you can imagine this type of generic function as part of a larger SQL framework that you might be the author or even just the user of. Anyway, Right now this function is not very generic at all, as it simply initializes all elements with a default constructed value based on the buffer's template type. If we now run this, we can see that since this is a float buffer, every element gets initialized to zero. Now one way we could make our function more generic is by passing a value of type data t into it and use it to initialize our buffer. However, this way we are limited to initializing the buffer with a single value. What if we want to initialize the buffer with different values for each element? A more generic version of this could be to define some form of initialization function that, when called with the work item ID, returns the value that we want to have in our buffer at that index. Let's start simple by implementing a scalar initializer that again only initializes the buffer to a single value. Since we are working generically here, let's also make this a templated type. Let's also make this generic enough to accept work item IDs for any dimensionality. Let's now adjust our generic init function to also receive this initializer. Again, we are working generically, so let's make this a template template parameter. Let's call it init op. Now here we want an init op that has the same data type and dimensions as our buffer, and we then want to use it within our kernel by passing the work item ID we receive. It's also a good idea at this point to make sure to have a unique kernel name for any type of init operation we pass into here. So let's template it with the init op functor type. Now all that's left to do is to pass the additional argument to our generic init function by constructing an instance of the scalar init functor. In this case, let's initialize our entire buffer with the value 33. Okay, so far so good, but we haven't used any placeholder accessors at this point, so what's the deal here? Now imagine a scenario where instead of initializing our buffer with a scalar value, you might want to initialize it based on the values in an existing buffer. For simplicity, let's just do a copy initializer for now. So let's create another buffer, let's call it other buff, and make it the same size as our original buffer. I'd also like to initialize this buffer with some pre-existing data. So let's create a vector with the same size as our buffer and initialize all of its elements with the value 44. We'll use this vector to initialize our new buffer. Let's now add a second generic initialization functor. We're going to call it copy init. In this case, we don't want to receive a scalar value as an argument, but we somehow want to copy the existing values from our new buffer. A good first step here will be to receive the buffer as an argument to our constructor. What we however cannot do here is to store this buffer inside the functor. Reason being that the sickle spec actually explicitly forbids capturing buffers within kernel functions. And if you think about it, since we are capturing the init op parameter inside our generic kernel lambda, this is exactly what we would be doing. However, we can't actually get to the buffer data through the buffer object anyways. What we really want, of course, is to store an accessor inside our functor. Unfortunately, as you know, to create an accessor, we normally require a command group handler as an argument. This is to bind that accessor to the command group corresponding to the handler, thus telling SQL that in order to execute it, we need access to the associated buffer memory. In this case, however, we don't have a command group handler just yet, as we want to construct our copy init functor at the same location as the scalar init one, which is outside of the actual command group. So what we need now, you can guess it, is a placeholder accessor. Since declaring placeholder accessors can get a bit verbose, I want to first create a template alias to relieve us of some of the typing work here. So we want our placeholder accessor type to be a SQL accessor for a certain data type, with certain dimensions, and a certain access mode. For now we assume that we always want to access a global buffer. Importantly, we now set the placeholder true type as the final argument. Going back to our copy init functor, we now want to store a placeholder accessor for our data type and dimensions for reading from this buffer. This way, we can now simply return the accessor's value at the given ID from our function call operator. Now we're almost done, however there is one important step left to do, and that is that we still have to associate this accessor with the command group function at some point, informing SQL that there exists a data dependency onto this given buffer from within this command group. 
To do so, we can use the command group handler's require function, which takes a placeholder accessor as its only argument. To make this generic again, let's create another member function in our init functor. Let's call it bind, taking the command group handler as an argument. Inside this bind function, we can now call require on the command group handler, passing in our placeholder accessor. If we now run this, you can see our buffer has been initialized by copying the value 44 from the other buffer. Alright, by now you've seen how placeholder accessors can be used to write a generic kernel function that is somewhat decoupled from the data it operates on. However, I think we have to go one small step further to really drive the value of placeholder accessors home. Let's assume now that we have yet another buffer and let's initialize this with a different host vector, containing the value 55. What we want now is to have an initialization functor that initializes our buffer with the sum of these two existing buffers. Let's start by adding the call for this new functor, which we're going to name sum init and which will naturally have to take both buffers as arguments. For the implementation, we now need two accessors here, and we also need to receive the two buffers in our constructor. Accessor A is initialized with buffer A, while accessor B is initialized with buffer B. Let's also make sure to require both accessors in our bind function. Finally, we can simply adjust our operator by returning the sum of the values of accessor A and accessor B. There's no changes required in our generic init function this time. Let's try this now. As you can see, we've successfully initialized our buffer with the sum of the two buffers holding 44 and 55 respectively, which amounts to 99. I hope I could somewhat convey to you how placeholder accessors offer you a way to write generic SQL programs with kernels that are decoupled from the data they are operating on. This makes them a powerful tool for generic programming and library development. However, I will admit that placeholder accessors are more of an advanced concept that you might not need in your day-to-day -day SQL development. Finally, I'd just like to briefly mention that while the placeholder template parameter is being deprecated in SQL 2020, the functionality is not going anywhere. In fact, creating placeholder accessors will be much more convenient in SQL 2020, as any accessor created without a command group handler is automatically considered a placeholder, regardless of its template type. Alright, I'd like to bring things to a close with a few more small tips. Besides the SQL buffers that we've seen throughout this session, there also exists images that allow you to work with image data more conveniently. Simply create an image by specifying the image channel order, the data type of the values you're storing, as well as the image's width and height. To work with images from within kernels, we again create accessors. Though this time, we have to specify as what data type we want to access the images from within the kernel. Note that while we specified the image data to be stored as unsigned bytes on the host, we access it as float4 vectors from within the kernel. We can then access the image data either directly through the accessors or by using a so-called sampler. With these sample settings, we can replicate the behavior of the convolution kernel we discussed during the section on host device debugging without having to do any manual wraparound index computations. Notably, the wraparound behavior is not only provided by the sampler, it might even be implemented in hardware. However, note that for this to work, we need to specify our image coordinates as normalized floating point values instead of exact integer indices. For this reason, images and samplers may not be suitable in every situation. It's also worth noting that by using images, depending on our SQL implementation, the image data may actually be stored in a special texture memory of the compute device. This may result in improved performance in some situations. Speaking of performance, if you want to get more accurate measurements of your kernel execution times, you can use SQL events to obtain detailed hardware timings. Start by constructing your queue with the enable profiling property. Next, store the event returned when submitting your command group function. You can then use this event to get timestamps for when your kernel was submitted, when it started and when it ended. You may see large discrepancies between your execution times measured on the host and your kernel event timings. This is for a couple of reasons. First of all, a small overhead due to the SQL runtime is expected. Next, as we've discussed before, implicit data movement might be captured within your host timings. Finally, on some platforms, the first time you execute a kernel, it actually needs to be compiled from an intermediate representation into a binary representation that can be understood by your compute device. While this should only happen once per kernel, in some situations it might be beneficial to offload this compilation to an earlier point in time, thus reducing kernel launch latency. To do so, simply create a SQL program object passing at the context obtained from your queue. Then compile your kernel by specifying the kernel name you're using in your call to parallel 4 below. Finally, get the kernel object from the program by calling getKernel, again passing the name. Now simply pass the kernel object as the first parameter into your parallel 4 call. Note that you still have to keep the kernel lambda here because that's the implementation what's ultimately being compiled into your kernel object. If we now run our benchmark again, we can see that the bulk of the time we previously measured on the host can actually be attributed to the compilation time of the kernel. Note that with SQL 2020's move towards a more generalized backend model, the APIs for pre-compiling kernels will be exposed somewhat differently, but the functionality remains.
Finally, I'd like to take a quick moment to talk about the project that I'm involved in. It's called Celerity and it's an open source distributed runtime system and API that tries to stay as close as possible to the SQL language while allowing you to target clusters of GPUs with your programs, requiring only minimal changes. So let's take a quick look at how you can convert an existing SQL program to Celerity. What I have here is an extremely simple matrix addition kernel that updates the values stored in buffer B by adding to it the values stored in buffer A. Let's now convert this from a SQL program that runs on a single compute device into a Celerity program that can run on an entire cluster of compute devices. We start by replacing the SQL header with the Celerity header. Next, we replace the SQL queue with the Celerity distributed queue. Likewise, replace the SQL buffers with Celerity buffers and the SQL handler with the Celerity handler. I hope you're seeing the theme here. Also, we have to ensure to capture everything by value here. Now we're almost done. There's just one more thing to do. Remember how we used ranged accessors to give the SQL runtime more information about which parts of the buffer we intend to access from within our kernels. The Celerity runtime requires a similar piece of information, albeit a bit more detailed. For this purpose, Celerity offers so-called range mappers that specify how each individual work item accesses a certain buffer. In this case, we are only accessing our buffer at the exact index we are executing our kernel at, which means that we have a one-to-one -one mapping from work item IDs to buffer accesses. We thus use Celerity's one-to-one -one range mapper for both buffers. And that's pretty much it. This program can now run on a cluster of GPUs with the global kernel size being split across however many GPUs we can provide. There are a few more steps required if we then want to regain a coherent view of this data, as after this kernel's execution it will be distributed in our cluster. However, I will not go into this now. If this piqued your interest, check out Celerity on github.com slash Celerity and visit our website where we have a full application tutorial. We also have a new release coming up in September with a lot of exciting new features and improvements. I'd love to get your feedback on it. And that concludes uh, this tutorial and my contribution to the SQL Summer Sessions. If there's one last piece of advice I can give you, it's that I want to encourage you to um, check out the SQL spec yourself. I think it's actually quite well written and actually readable, uh, and I've learned quite a lot of things from it. Other than that, if you have any SQL tips and tricks that you've discovered yourself, let me know. And uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys around.